Welcome to the Collier County Public Library Virtual Book Club for February. My name is Kenneth. I'm Anna. And thanks for joining us. Welcome. We're going to be talking about uh, The Wangs versus the World. Mm, press the wrong button. <laughs> there you the go. Wangs vs. the World by Jade Chang. Uh, amidst the market crash of 2008, makeup tycoon Charles Wang makes a big bet that didn't pay off resulting in the seizure of all of his assets. This comes as a bit of a shock to his second wife, Barbara, and his three mostly adult children, Sena, Andrew, and Grace. He follows everything he can from his Beller home into the borrowed ancient station wagon, the only vehicle not to be repossessed, pulls Grace and Andrew from school, and embarks on a cross-country road trip to Sena's upstate New York estate. Uh, I made a map here of the route that they take. Um, so starting here in Bel Air, going to back over to Santa Barbara, to Vernon, 29 Palms, Phoenix, El Paso, Austin, New Orleans, uh, Opelika, Alabama, Atlanta, and then up to New York, uh, with lots of different things happening on the way. Uh, so it's kind of billed as a Crazy Rich Asians road trip mashup. Uh, I don't think it comes out of something entirely different uh, to me. Um, a funny, sweet, sad, and fully human analysis of an American family with lots of surprises in store. So, there uh, were definitely surprises, yes. Uh, uh, your thoughts? Well, um, I thought it was interesting. It took me a little bit to get into. Um, I wasn't sure that I fully bought into all the characters at first, but I did end up liking Grace very much. Um, she's the 16-year-old uh, and is a uh, someone who wants to be a fashion influencer before there were influencers. Mm -hmm. you know, she had a blog, um, this is 2008, so this was you know before Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. I mean, I, there was Twitter, but I thought it wasn't that big. She, in my write-up, I thought she was an Instagram influencer, but you're right, Instagram didn't exist and no. she was just doing a blog. She was just doing yep. a blog. But, um, and I liked, I liked the, the son, Andrew, I thought he was really sweet, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, kind of naive, um, but um, really, really had a good heart, I think, you know, he wanted to fall in love with somebody, which is, <laughs> I think, a very noble That's what a lot of people aspiration, want. yes. Yep. Yep. I wasn't as fond of the father, but um, that's just my opinion. Uh, yeah, all the characters had... Uh, flaws, in some cases very significant flaws, uh, but I think that served to make them human and very interesting to uh, kind of watch, you know, tear themselves down and rebuild themselves over the course of the novel, uh, which is, you know, character growth. It's always interesting to uh, watch. Yes. And, you know, something you always want from... Absolutely. Or something you want from your novel characters <laughs> yes. most of the time. Assumption that you always want character growth from your characters, yes. Um, so let's uh, let's look at the questions we got. Okay. Uh, so question one is why is why is Charles Wang mad at America and mad at history? Does he have a right to be? Well, in, in the beginning, we find out that um, Charles actually it, it's pronounced Wong, I think. Yes. Not Wang, um, and it means king in Chinese, which I thought was a fair choice because he does seem to think of himself as somebody who deserves more than what he's been given. Um, his, he, he was born, he wasn't born in China, in fact he's never set foot in China, he was born in Taiwan I believe, and uh, his parents had been, um, had their land stripped from them by the Communist Party and were um, refugees in Taiwan, as many of the big landholders were. Um, and uh, where am I going with this? <laughs> oh yeah, so he has he, he, he still has these documents that say his family owns land, and since he's the only person left in his family, he's the rightful landowner that he wants to get these lands back from the communists, which is very, very unlikely to happen. Um, so he feels stripped of his birthright in that sense, but he comes to America and he builds himself up out of nothing, pretty much. And uh, and then, after a bad 
um, a catastrophic um, combination of things, him making a bad business deal, him betting his house on it, and then the stock market crash of 2008 with the recession and just completely destroyed everything that he owned. I mean, he lost it all. The house, the cars, everything in them. You know, he couldn't put his kids through school anymore. Um, and even his oldest daughter who had come into her trust, it was in question whether or not she would be able to keep it. So yeah, he, he feels, um, he's, he's kind of falling apart as he's traveling across the country. And, and that's very easy to see. And um, I, I did feel bad for him because he did lose everything. And that's a really harsh reality for anybody. You know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he basically is mad at America and mad at history because they betrayed him. Uh, they should have given him uh, more than he more than he got, or uh, been able to keep more than he had. Uh, America lured him in, gave him riches, and dumped him out when it was done playing with him. Uh, history, if history hadn't you know advanced and done its thing, uh, he would be safe and happy in his ancestral lands. Um, so his current troubles are primarily his own design, uh, you know, taking out bad loans and putting up without his collateral. Uh, but the politics and policies of America did have a hand in causing the crash, causing that downfall. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so it wasn't all should, his fault. Should he be mad at America? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, should he be mad at history? That's a larger and more difficult question uh, because you, know, you can be mad at it all you want, but you won't change it. Uh, but you might uh, possibly be able to uh, make amends, or uh, you know, find some find some restitution somehow. Or reconciliation. Yeah. It yes. Okay. Uh, question two: How does this story differ from other immigrant stories you may have read, and how does it differ in tone? Well, um, I think the tone is um, it's. Even though it's very tragic, I think that there she, the author, um, tried to make it humorous. There were some parts in there. I, I don't know if my sense of humor jives with the authors, so I didn't quite laugh out loud at any point. But there were some points that were just kind of, kind of sad and kind of funny. Like when um, they are dropping off um, Ama, which means, um, I guess it's kind of like a grandmotherly term. I think so. And um, might mean wet nurse. Wet nurse, I think. It been Charles's, um, you know, caregiver when he had been a child, and uh, they drop her off at her daughter's house. Was it Twenty Nine Palms? Yep. And um, and then later on the road, they're like, "What's Amma's name?" Well, it's Amma. Well, no, that's not a name. That's a title. What is her real name? And nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. They call the they call the other daughter in New York, and she's, she's like, like well, 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 "Doesn't Dad know?" And yeah. he obviously doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, so. So that was that was it was, it was it was funny, but it was also like, "Wow, that's that's really awful too." <laughs> so um, yeah, but the, but the tone was definitely um, kind of like a comedy of errors, I would say, mm -hmm. um, very much so, and uh, you know the. Uh, the road trip lends itself, I think, really well to that. The tone was definitely a bit all over the place because the perspective shifts between five, uh, even six or seven major characters mm -hmm. um, and how they're all dealing with their own problems in addition to the greater problem of them losing everything. Um, and they all have unique insight and perspective into um, you know, life and their life as Chinese Americans mm -hmm. uh, to loop into the immigrant story question. Right, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of some other immigrant stories. Well, the, uh, the obvious oh. one for us is Americana, Americana, which we read a few months back. Yes. Um, by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Don't do that. Darn it. That's okay. You did fine. I practiced it. <laughs> um, so we read that a few months ago. Yes. And so a lot of immigrant stories focus on. You know, the slow and steady climb to wealth or self-acceptance of somebody who just recently came to the country. Right. And for Charles and Barbara, they were wealthy and successful pretty much immediately when they came over. Uh, didn't have to, didn't have that big struggle, or at least 
at least we don't read about that. We read about their downfall. Right. Um, so that's a shift. I did read somewhere someone called it a riches to rags story instead of the other way around, which makes sense. Um, and yeah, generally when you're reading a story about an immigrant, it's about their first impressions coming to the country, how they react to um, assimilation, um, whereas these folks are pretty well assimilated, I think, by the time mm -hmm. we meet them. The children especially are, since they were all born in the United States. Right. Um, and then um, they, they have a different set of, of problems that they have to deal with. So. In an interview, Chang said that she wanted to illuminate a new take on belonging in America with immigrants who don't yearn for acceptance or struggle to fit in. And that isn't part of their narrative here. No, it's not. Yeah. Although I wonder... But there's a little bit, yeah. you know, just on a personal level, but not, yeah. you know, fitting in as Americans. Because mm -hmm. they are. Yes, yes. What's the next question? Question three. Describe the members of the Wang family. What are their particular hopes and internal conflicts? So, Why don't you start with Charles? Fun. Charles. Um, so one thing he's got is he's obsessed with the idea that he can reclaim his family's supposed ancestral lands from the Chinese government, which uh, sounds ridiculous. Uh, so and that's something that he uh, you know falls further and further into as the book progresses. It almost becomes well, it is an obsession for him, but almost to the point of he has tunnel vision and he can't see anything else. Right. Um, so. It, he basically needs to, he needs hope, he needs his own, a way to, you know, something to claw, back to. claw yes. back to, well, the American dream mm -hmm. uh, ideal. Uh, Barbara uh, is his second wife. Uh, you hear a lot about his first wife who died in a helicopter accident. A very interesting helicopter accident. Uh, in the Grand Canyon. Yeah. <laughs> um, and all, all of his children are uh, the children of his first wife. Uh, so there's the stepmother. Uh, the uh, evil stepmother. Yeah, kind of an evil stepmother conflict. Although Barbara's not evil. Barbara's not evil, She's no. fine. She's, you know, hands off with the children. Uh, she never tried to parent them, uh, never tried to restrict them. But they, they, you know, they make fun of her and she resents them a little, a little. Um, uh, she's used to having the finer things in life, and she's having she's struggling with uh, her, you know, trust trusting her husband again. However, she wasn't always that way. She grew up very poor in Taiwan, and um, it's to the point where she and her parents were living in a room with bed rolls on the floor. And uh, when she heard that Charles Wang's Wang's first wife died she stole money from her parents to get a plane ticket to get to America and basically throw herself at him. And it ended up working out in her favor and she ended up <laughs> marrying him. So she went from rags to riches and actually did pretty okay with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so hers, hers is kind of the crisis of faith in her husband. Right. Uh, that's her arc. And then uh, Saya is a former high profile New York artist having problems with love. Uh, she's got an old flame who keeps uh, burning back into town, uh, trying to sweep her up into his orbit. Uh, and she's got the new steady guy uh, who's, you know, a, a farmer's market farmer mm -hmm. and uh, just completely delightful. Yes, uh, I really liked Leo. I thought <laughs> he was a good character. Very sturdy, very self-assured. Um, but she's got she's got a connection to this other guy Grayson, um, and so that uh, so that's her her problem her main conflict. Uh, she's also hiding out in upstate New York uh, from a failure of her own in the art world. Mm -hmm. uh, so she got panned by the press in her last art show, which she thought was her most significant, and uh, basically put her tail between her legs and ran out to upstate New York to buy a house in the Catskills. And she bought a house and doesn't have a mortgage, so uh, the bank's not going to take that house. Right. <laughs> Important point. And it's in her name, not yes. her father's. So, uh, so that's at least a base that they have. They can recoup, and that's why they're doing the whole journey there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Andrew? Andrew, the sweet peacekeeper of the family, the middle child, uh, is a college student, virgin, and aspiring stand-up comedian with an 
unironically abysmal sense of humor. Yeah, he really is sad. I mean, not good at it. No, he's, he's, very, <laughs> he's very bad at being a stand up comedian. And he uh, knows it, but he won't admit it to himself. <laughs> Poor uh, so, yeah, he's, he's kind of the sweet moral center of the family, um, the peacekeeper, like I said. Um, and it, his moments really, I think, really popped with familial interaction mm -hmm. and uh, you know, making it, you know, bring, bringing everybody together. Until he kind of rips that up later. But um, well, I'm not going to go into that. Anymore. No, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. You gotta do uh, something for people, right? <laughs> and then finally, Grace, uh, who's packed away to boarding school, is a teenage style blogger uh, who is uh, kind of left out of the loop of everything, uh, finds it hard to uh, reach her family members, uh, and is just extremely distressed by how unfair everything is. Uh, you know, this situation, especially, obviously, but. Uh, but she's 16, so everything's unfair anyway. Every, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's unfair to a 16-year-old. So, yeah, that's them. Uh, and it's just an explosive combination of, of, you know, just examining the lens of the American family. Mm -hmm. I, I also wanted to say something about uh, Wang versus Wong. Yeah. Uh, so Charles does mention that, yes. you know, his, uh, the, the name is supposed to be pronounced in the Chinese as Wang, uh, and it was Americanized to Wang, uh, you know, with all the euphemisms that comes with. Right. Um, I, the, I made sure to listen to this part of the book. It's, uh, it, in the Hoopla, you know, recorded yeah. translation. I've listened to some of it It's too. Uh, The Wangs Versus the World. Okay. And I think that is the title okay. of the book. Uh, it has to be the title of the book. Okay. Uh, just because that kind of encapsulates the uh, issues that they have with, or at least the issues that Charles has with the country. Um, even though, I, I don't think it's ever pronounced as Wong, except I for when he's, you know, his, going into it. When he's with his friend in New Orleans, what was his name? The guy, the Uncle, Uncle something. Anyway, the kids call him Uncle, but he was he was his friend who um, he had met when he the the guy was learning Chinese and becoming a student of Chinese when they were living in California, and he pronounced it Wong mm -hmm. when I was yeah. listening to it. So he, yeah, he pronounces sense. it the proper way, um, but everybody else is Wang. Yes. Yep. Uh, question four. So how does the novel portray the power of the internet? It takes place in two thousand eight. Is the net different today? Oh, hugely different. Yep. Uh, so the internet is, uh, you know, it's definitely clear that it's a powerful and dangerous tool. Uh, I don't think the book really goes into it a whole lot. No, I don't think so either. Uh, it's not a huge player in the novel. Um, obviously, they use it uh, mm -hmm. for communication. Um, Everybody research, has a phone. Phones. A couple of them have laptops. And Grace, in particular, uh, would be an avid, avid user of social media. Um, she has a blog, mm -hmm. but uh, if the book were set today, I don't think it would be particularly different in no, that she'd regard. she'd just be on Instagram. Yeah. And she would be getting much faster feedback, I think, than she was. She'd have a lot of likes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, question five. Okay. So what does Chang have to say about the worlds of makeup, fashion, visual arts, and stand-up comedy? Uh, what are the differing currencies that determine success or failure in those areas? Well, let's take the first one, which was makeup and fashion. So Grace is a fashion blogger, and her father is um, the makeup tycoon. Makeup tycoon. So there was a lot of um, talk of makeup in the book, actually. Um, uh, the the stepmother Barbara um, talks in this one particular chapter um, talks about the way she puts on her face every morning, and you know she talks about going through the steps of putting on her makeup and then taking it all off again at night. And I thought that was a really interesting little scene there, kind of like showing how she puts on her face for the world and then takes it off again. So she's like herself. And there's the, there's the face that she has, there's, a yeah, okay. there's the face that she has for um, just being 
who she is untouched, and then there's the face that she projects to the world. So it's like her two selves. And I thought that was an interesting little. I might need to make a note about that later to discuss next week, which is a really interesting moment. Okay. Um, yeah, so she has a lot to say about art. Uh, since all of his children are artists, artists. in some way, mm -hmm. uh, stand up comedian, uh, visual artist, and uh, fashion blogger. Um, and he himself has a career in the makeup industry where art is really crucial. Yes, advertising is the thing. Um, Visual advertising. Uh, in, in her interview in the back of the book, she says that all these creative worlds are, involve a fine balance of art and artifice, effort and swagger. Um, you need to have creative talent, technical skill, a lot of inspiration, courage, and not only that, but you have to hit the audience in the right way at the right time. Exactly, timing, um, especially in comedy, timing is everything, <laughs> right? Which is something that both Sina and Andrew struggle with yes. in the book. So, yes, that's very true. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of her take on that. And the determine, determination of success or failure in these areas. Um, well, um, Sina, she, she said something interesting else in the story that she had um, never thought about being in love as part of the trajectory of her life. She had always thought of it as something secondary that happened after her art career until she met Grayson and then Leo after that. So um, I thought that was an interesting little tidbit in there. So whether that was a success or a failure, because she does, she does have a problem saying no to Grayson. Right. And Grayson is a terrible person. Yeah. Just abominable. Not the kind of person you want to be in your life. So. He'll tear everything up if he gets a chance. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, join us next week for uh, our discussion of this book on Zoom. You can email me. Kenneth.hardcastle at colliercountyfl.gov. Um, and we'll, we'll be discussing this at 2 o'clock next week. Yeah, so. send you an invitation. You can get online and join us. We would love to see you. Find out what you have to say about the book. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye bye. bye. Can you listen to Saha? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Very fine. Oh, it's looking it up now. I couldn't see the button to turn it <laughs> up, the blue.